Florida State and Clemson to the Big 12 is on the table? What? This is Locked On Big 12. You are Locked On Big 12, your daily podcast on the Big 12 Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome to Locked On Big 12. I'm Drake Toll from America's number one Big 12 podcast, Locked On Big 12. Thanks for making it your first listen every single day. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network today. Florida State and Clemson might come to our conference, and I'm not the one saying it. Also in the middle segment, Houston and Iowa State are headed to the Sweet 16. In the final segment, Kim Mulkey's character is being audited. Florida State and Clemson to the Big 12 is not something that I would make the case for, but Somebody that has a big name in sports media brought it up, and it's Dennis Dodd of CBS. So before you think like, oh, clickbait title, this is the stupidest thing ever. No, Dennis Dodd, the real guy who you've heard of, actually mentioned the idea of Florida State and Clemson coming to the Big 12 in an article that he wrote over the weekend. Now, what is wild here is he doesn't necessarily believe that these two teams are attractive brands right now. What he starts by saying in the CBS article is FSU and Clemson are attractive brands. They're just not attractive brands right now. The SEC has again decided to play eight conference games in 2025. If it ever moves to nine, let's say in 2026, the league will ask ESPN to be compensated for the extra games. So that makes sense. What we're talking about here is Florida State and Clemson, for context, are suing the ACC. They likely want to leave. They're going to leave. They're going to go. And after that, UNC and Miami and NC State and Virginia Tech and Virginia, a lot of these other schools are going to follow suit. Now, we know right now that certain schools, universities are also suing Florida State back or have at least they have said they support the ACC in their efforts to sue Florida State back. So like you're suing me, nah, I'm suing you. And they're currently figuring out which state that's all going to happen in. And that, that's a wild mess. But the, the root here is Florida State and Clemson. They are looking for a new home. And Dodd says that as of right now, they are just not that attractive. He even makes the case that as these two teams leave the ACC, other hyenas, as he calls them, will follow North Carolina being included. Dodd is quoted as saying North Carolina would be high on any list, perhaps even ahead of Florida State and Clemson. The UNC brand is among the most recognizable in sports. It is highly desired when Jim Delaney was Big Ten commissioner, viewed as the most powerful figure in college sports. It'll be desired in both the SEC and Big Ten today. Now, I, I don't disagree that North Carolina will be a desirable option here when you talk footprint and brand, the whole Jordan thing. I mean, North Carolina, that's great. Academically, they fit in too. We have the whole conversation about how the Big Ten is very pompous with who they allow in from an academic standpoint. You must have AAU distinction. So to read that, maybe you could make a case that North Carolina is a, a top brand in the ACC, but above Florida State? Above Clemson? Right. It would just just you hear that. You're like, yeah. North Carolina, they're better than Clemson and Florida State from a brand standpoint. They're definitely not better than Florida State. They're legitimately not better than them. When you think about from an outside perspective too, about the the outside forces that make Florida State what it is when you've talked even their partnerships outside of the country and with the money they're able to bring in. That's just that's like not even university sanctioned. They have deep pockets that run past Tallahassee. And for Clemson, we just saw from CFP valuations, they are one of the most valuable schools in the country because of their ability to make the college football playoffs. So for Dodd to say that North Carolina is right there ahead of them, that's interesting to me. So that's all the preface before he goes into the Big 12 option. He labels this part of the article the Big 12 option. So already as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, huh, weird. And he makes a whole big stink about Florida State and Clemson and their their academic standing and if they could get in the Big Ten, which to be honest with you, Dennis, and everybody else listening, this is what you bring to your water cooler. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's not going to matter. The academic thing, when money when money is at play here, right? when millions of dollars are at play, the academics don't matter near as much. The Big Ten is looking to expand athletically, and they don't care as much about academics as they did 10 years ago. But here is where I, my mind explodes. My small pea brain explodes. Dodd says, While the goal for FSU and Clemson, direct quote, is to join the Big Ten of the SEC, the Big 12 could serve as a fallback fallback plan, which is where I go full stop and go, what the hell are you talking about? I, I don't. I, me, me, I host Locked On Big 12. 
And how great would it be to create a show tomorrow that's titled Florida State and Clemson to the Big 12? But that'd be my opinion, right? That'd be, that's awesome. I'm the one that's supposed to blow hot air up your skirt about the Big 12 and its chances of surviving. But here is a legitimate source, a legitimate person, an, an article at CBS that says, here's a fallback plan. Florida State and Clemson to the Big 12. He says, but if the Knowles and Tigers aren't worth that $60 million per year number for the SEC, which is effectively, he says, like their buy-in or their minimum cover charge to make a move, why would they take less money just to leave the ACC? Well, they wouldn't necessarily get less money in the Big 12. If you look at current standings of where each conference is paying their teams, the Big 12 will, through 2036, pay its members, or at least through 2031, pay its members more than the ACC. Everyone in this conference will be richer than every team in the ACC, based off of TV money alone, because the ACC's current grant of rights and their contract with ESPN is how you say in our industry, bad. And the Big 12s is how you say good. So coming to this conference wouldn't mean they'd make less money than they would in the ACC. And I'm not really sure how he would justify that. The only thing I could think he could justify that with is the college football playoff, where ACC members will get more money than the Big 12, at least until 2028. When remember, we're going to reevaluate that with a look in and say, hey, how's everybody doing realignment wise? Can we give you some more money? Sure. Big 12. Here you go. He continues here with his whole Big 12 thing. A Big 12 union seems possible. And again, I read this and I go full stop. What the hell? What are we talking about? How? I, I This is like, last second buzzer beater March Madness. I'm looking around the room going, how did this happen? What are we what are we doing here? A Big 12 union seems possible if right holders would be willing to increase the value of the league's media rights agreement. In essence, what that statement should mean to dumb it down for you and even for me, I had to read it like four times, is that ESPN or Fox or CBS or somebody, ESPN, would have to say, I want my property, effectively their property, uh, Clemson and Florida State to be in the Big 12 to create a power league. I want to create three power leagues and make this conference on par with the Big Ten and the SEC. Now, I do believe there are some perks to that. You could make the case right now, and I would I would even make the case that the ACC and ESPN have such a deal that benefits ESPN. They're, they're paying very little money for a product they can make more money off of. So why would they want to create a third power league that moves Florida State and Clemson to the Big 12? Would they make more money? Would those two teams make more money for the TV network in the Big 12? I don't think so, but Dodd seems to think that the right holders could be willing to go to an agreement that bumps every team in the Big 12 up a certain wild percentage and allows those two, those two teams in the conference in a way that is profitable profitable for not just ESPN and the Big 12, but specifically Florida State and Clemson. Because guess what? The whole move they're making right now is to do one thing, and that is make more Money. He continues, its teams are currently set to earn 32 million per year, lowest among the power four, which I'm not really sure. Like the ACC's TV contract is not good. The Big 12's TV contract with ESPN pays out more per team than the ACC's. The only thing that he could be, I could possibly be like, I, I don't know what he's talking about here. Maybe it's the college football playoff revenue, because again, the Pac-12 or the ACC, Pac-12 makes nothing. Uh, well, actually, they make something. But the ACC makes more than the Big 12. But from a TV revenue standpoint, they, they don't. They don't. The TV contract spends with Florida State and Clemson are leaving is because teams will, on average, make less than the Big 12 over the course of the next eight some odd years. Uh, he says that's a revenue gap of $28 million, less than the ACC, uh, the, than the SEC, $43 million in the Big 10. So in essence, the Big 12 is making $32 million a year. Uh, it's a revenue gap of $28 million with the SEC and 43 million with the Big Ten. So these numbers are big, very big. And why would it make any sense to include in your article a Big 12 option for Florida State and Clemson? That is something that I can't justify. Like I, when I tell you, here's my reaction to that. Here is what you're getting from me in segment one of today's podcast. Dennis Dodd wrote an article that says the Big 12 option for Florida State and Clemson. And my reaction is any idea of there being a Big 12 option for Florida State and Clemson is news to me and absolutely like borderline impossible as close to you get like I have a better shot with Livy Dunn than the big 12 does with Clemson and Florida state. And that is saying a lot, a lot. I th- like, what are we doing coming up? Houston and Iowa state are going to the sweet 16. What's been a relatively disappointing uh, March for the big 12 was crazy last night for Houston and Iowa State's moving on to the Locked On Big 12, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team and every day.
Today's show is brought to you by Nissan. If you want to be like me, then drive a Nissan. If you want to be like me as well, get blonde hair. I don't know. This week's Mark Madness bracket highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we are picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any and all of the new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys are able to make it to the next level. Uh, the North Carolina Tar Heels can only be described as an armada. They are a one seed and they are as hardcore as it gets. They just keep winning. And now they have a spot in the Sweet 16 this Thursday against Alabama. They're a favorite. They are favored by many to win their region at the very least. And they could and they will make a run for the championship, in my opinion, at least. That is just like the Nissan Armada. That's your championship winning vehicle. Take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. ShopNissanUSA.com today. Visit ShopNissanUSA.com Today's show is also brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel is where I go to make money. This weekend, I was down $300 and then I said, you know what? I need to stop stop doing that. I need to make money. And I did. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. So you don't have to just have like a perfect bracket altogether, you know, pick every game, right? There's 60 some odd games. You instead can go to FanDuel and just get one game right and make some money. It's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets. Your first $5 bet wins. But a $5 bet on Houston to beat Duke. And if it wins, you get $200 in bonus bets. That's 200 bucks. Right now on point spreads, money lines, you can even do a, a who's going to win it all with that $200 in free play. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet college hoops till they cut down the nets. FanDuel.com forward slash locked on. You can go there today and make some money. FanDuel.com forward slash locked on. Houston beating Texas A&M last night in one of the craziest, wackiest, stupidest games you could possibly imagine. I'm setting can I can I paint you a picture here? I'm setting up at 11 p.m. at my desk to record this podcast and I think the game is over. Houston's up by 13. There's no way that A&M even makes this remotely a game and instead 48 points in the Aggies in the second half. They played this whole free throw game. Houston doesn't make all their free throws. At some point, Jamal Shedd fouls out. That was an overtime. LJ Cryer fouls out. Francis fouls out. This was an ugly, terrible, awful game. But guess what Houston did? They survived. And guess what Iowa State did? They survived. They forgot how to play offense in the first half against, against Washington State on Saturday. And they still won. This, these are two very different games. I thought Houston's offense was as good as it's been all year. We saw them score. I think it was against Oklahoma, 85 points. Felt like that was, hey, even when the defense isn't exactly 100%, the offense can be there. And I wouldn't say that Iowa State, that applies. I wouldn't say, oh, well, when Iowa State's defense shows up or doesn't show up, the offense can be there. I've been worried about Iowa State's offense. And they didn't, to me, it wasn't, oh, wow, Iowa State's offense just took over against Washington State. No, the defense beat the Cougars into submission at the end of this one. 67 to 56 was the final score. Score. Washington State did not score more than 29 points in either the first or the second half. To start in that game, I was worried very early. I go back to that 59-41 game against Pitt last year where Iowa State lost because the offense just wasn't there. And in the first half of this one, I thought, oh no, Washington State looks good. Iowa State does not. I don't like that. I got immediate flashbacks, but I shouldn't have. Tame and Lipsy exists, and scoring 15 points for Iowa State is like scoring 30 for most teams. That is good. That's a, a fourth-ish of the team's points against Washington State, and the defense was elite. Even when the offense isn't 100%, they aren't perfect. They aren't putting up big numbers. The defense is so good, so much better even than it was last year, in my opinion, that Iowa State can make a run continually. They are still my favorite to go to the Final Four. I love, I love what TJ Otzelberger has done. I think they beat Illinois by double digits. I thought that BYU would beat Illinois by double digits. As we know, they lost to Duquesne. Iowa State, to me, still my final four pick. The defense is that good. I don't believe that Illinois has seen something like that playing in the Big Ten, and I've got Iowa State waltzing past Illinois. Now to address the Houston conundrum. Look, it happens. This... The closest I've been to a national championship team was 2021. I was a sophomore at Baylor at the time and followed that team very closely, watched them live weekly and watched them play in Indianapolis in the final four, watched them win the national championship against Gonzaga. At this Houston team, the only two things that I would use to compare to this Houston team that really match up well are an NBA squad or that 2021 Baylor national championship team. Because when the defense isn't isn't there or when the defense is there and the other team is just shooting red hot lights out the rad for kid for texas a and my hat it goes off it, like that dude didn't deserve to lose this game when that happens 
a national championship caliber team has to be good enough to have the third guy down the line, the fourth guy down the line that steps up and you go, oh, I didn't know that he was going to be that good. For Baylor, it was like an Adam Flagler. It was a, maybe a Macy OT. He wasn't the second best guy on the team, but he was that third option that if you really needed him, he was going to explode. Sharp for Houston. Shed for Houston. Cryer for Houston. The elven kid that comes in at the very end. Like, I don't know if he's single, but he's good now. You're set, buddy. Makes one free throw to help send Houston to the Sweet 16. We'll tell his grandkids that. Like, I, I'd never heard of this kid. I, I have watched a lot of Houston basketball this year. Ryan Elvin was not on my list of guys. The walk-on senior to help seal the deal for the Cougars in March Madness. But he did, and it rocked. That is what you need to win a national championship. You need guys that people might not have keyed in on, that might not be at the very top of of the scouting report to go off. And that was the case for Emmanuel Sharp. He was unreal in this win for Houston. He was unreal late. And Jamal Shedd might be the best player in the tournament. <laughs> I know people make these Zach Eady, you know, they, they love him and he's good. And I get it. He is good. I think Jamal Shedd has a legitimate case to be tournament MVP when all is said and done and Houston wins it all. My hack does go off to Texas A&M. You have to give them some credit for what they did. Houston is still my national champion. Also, fun aside, this tournament has kind of stunk. Just a lot of the like the right teams winning, you know? Baylor losing. Ugh. It's one of the few upsets of the day. It was gross, by the way. It was just a gross game. They, they were getting killed, and they weren't anymore, and they lost still. TCU losing. That ruined things. for Texas Tech there's just not fun things to happen for the Big 12. That's a point of conversation the rest of this week. What went wrong for some of these Big 12 teams? But I don't know. I don't feel like we performed to the level we were supposed to. The ACC is playing better than us right now. And I, I just don't think that's good for this conference. But Houston, Iowa State, you're anchoring us. The two best defensive teams are moving on. And I'm thankful. Coming up. Kim Mulkey's done it again. This is Locked On Big 12. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It is your team. And it is every day. Today's show is brought to you by LinkedIn Town Solutions. LinkedIn Town Solutions is where I go. It's when I think like, oh, shoot, I need to hire somebody for a job. I go to LinkedIn Town Solutions. When I need to hire an intern for this very show, I went to LinkedIn Town Solutions because they can help me hire faster. <clears throat> You got to check out LinkedIn Jobs. They have the tools to help you find the right professionals for free. They're not just another job board. They have a vast network of more than a billion professionals. And most small businesses, 86%, get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats. They might not have time or the resources to hire, so they want to help you. Two and a half small businesses. Two and a half million. <clears throat> two and a half is... Much smaller than two and a half million. Small businesses are using LinkedIn for hiring. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Kim Mulkey said some stuff, and the Washington Post is going to report on that stuff, most of which will pertain to her time at Baylor, I am sure. And I need you to know. I worked around Mulkey for a couple of years at Baylor, and she is as crazy as everybody says. And her press conference where she addressed this Washington Post article only made things worse. It's not been a banner week for Mulkey and company, as now everyone in America is waiting for the Washington Post, quote, hit piece they're going to publish on her. Here is what she had to say. And I, I can only break this down almost Line for line in her press conference. Again, most of this will come back from Baylor, where I was. I had like firsthand experience. Was there when Mulkey was there, and yes, she is a scary lady. Uh, but I, I get that why people in her corner love her. I, I do. I understand that. But I think this whole press conference thing is just absolute insanity. And here's what she had to say: The Washington Post has called former disgruntled players to get negative quotes to include in their story. First and foremost, I think she could just narrow it down to every player. There's a reason when stuff like this comes out, when Mulkey does something controversial, you don't ever see her former players saying, no, don't attack her. I love her. You know, we're friends. She's great. Very few of her former players come to her rescue. Very few of them told her congratulations on her national championship for LSU. Um, it's just funky. Her relationship with former players feels a bit transactional. They came in. They won a national championship. 
They won some games for her. You never really get to see the relationship side, the 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 behind the scenes for Mulkey. So calling disgruntled players narrows the list down to uh, almost all of her former players. Uh, also, her tone here is almost totalitarian. She's got a very aggressive thing going on. They're ignoring the 40 plus years of positive stories that that people or they have heard from people about me. I love it. I love the slip here of 40 years of positive stories, which uh, uh, not a lot of those that the people have said that they have come out. The people are 40 years of the stuff. But you see reporters who give a megaphone to a one sided embellished version of things aren't trying to tell the truth. Yeah, you tell them they're trying to sell newspapers and feed the click machine. I love it. This is like my, this is my grandmother, you know, like she'll scroll past something on Facebook that is uh, like this or you'll die tonight. And she'll send it to me. It's like, grandma, what? You're just she. My, my grandmother in those instances is just feeding the click machine. I do like, what is the click machine? I, I love the word inventing things here. She, again, she's very focused. This is exactly why people don't trust journalists and the media anymore. I, uh, yeah, you know, I, it's no surprise that journalism has changed over the last couple of years. At the same time, Kim, people being mad at you, you doing, you know, some things that are questionable or not great, which not a lot of denying of that here, by the way, not a lot of her saying, I didn't do it. Um, that to me is probably more telling. Like now she is coming to attack you. Like before this is reported on, she's not saying that none of this is true. I didn't do it. I'm a great person. Uh, she kind of tried at that with the whole 40 years of good stories thing. It's more of journalism is dead. Everything you read isn't true. They're just trying to sell you papers. It's like, oh, interesting. And I'm sure she's probably read clips or at least been asked questions. She did say earlier in the press conference, she had been given uh, a, a heads up by the reporter. The article was coming out and he'd asked some questions on a tight deadline that she couldn't make. And that, that was a point of controversy. But so obviously here she's again she's unhappy it's these kinds of sleazy tactics and hatchet jobs that people are just tired of i love it i love this is the everyman this is the aren't you guys all tired of bad journalism these people that are trying to bring me down and make me look bad she wants you to feel like she, she's in your camp you're in her camp your best friends like don't you see she's the victim i'm fed up and I'm not going to let the Washington Post attack this university, this awesome team of young women I have, or me without a fight. I've hired the best defamation law firm in the country, and I will sue the Washington Post if they publish a false story about me. I need you to know. Nobody really cared. Nobody really cared. This was like a one Pat Ford tweet and everybody just kind of went about their business. Just there'll be an article released about Kim Mulkey next week. And she, when she talks about this being a distraction for her team, she's the one creating the distraction for her team. That, come on. And it's just the, I'll hire a, I'll hire a law firm. They'll get you. No, I, I bet most of the stories, the players are going to tell in this are going to be true. And they're probably not going to paint you in a very good light. And Sure. Sue the Washington Post. I don't feel like that's going to go that well for Mulkey. Not many people are in a position to hold these kind of journalists accountable. But I am. But I am. Uh, and the dramatic page flip. I'll do it. And I'll do it. This is a mixture. I'm going to go, I'm going to go back one more time. Let's hear that again. I am. And I'll do it. Mm. That's all I'm going to say about this right now. And now I'm going to get back to talking about my basketball team and winning this game tomorrow. This feels a bit like my grandmother. What? And I'm I'm just so apolitical. I I don't. I I get paid to talk about sports. This feels like my grandmother was possessed by the spirit of Donald Trump. Just like the cadence and everything is just so like the hitting of the desk and the ve it 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 reminded me so much of a political speech. So much of a I am not guilty, right? Like the the glove doesn't fit. You must acquit. Some kind of that. What usually what how guilty people sound, I guess, is what I'm trying to, you know, you, you get that the aura in their voice of everybody else is wrong and I am right and I didn't do it and I'll sue you. 
I don't know. I just I, I think at this point we should not be surprised about stuff like this from Mulkey. And when the Washington Post, here's what maybe is the, the main point of this. When the Washington Post article comes out, it's going to say some things and they're probably they're going to be damning. We will learn nothing new. We will see things that we have probably known, especially those of us who worked around her. Baylor were going on for 20 years. And when those of us who have worked around her see them, we're going to go. And, you know, like, yeah, yeah, I already knew this. I oh, already heard that one through the grapevine. And nobody really cared then. And LSU is not going to care now. Her job is safe. She's fine. Nothing is going to happen to her. There will be no repercussions from this article. So why did she make a stink about this? Publicity. She's one of the best PR people I've ever been around. When it co- If you believe the statement that no publicity is bad publicity, that is what Kim Mulkey thrives off of. And she's doing it again here. Take with it. Do with it what you will. Crazy. That's the best. Crazy. Lover, hater. I don't know. But wild stuff from Kim Mulkey. Coming up the rest of this week, more basketball. Houston, Iowa State. How did your team lose? Your team has already done. Maybe some women's basketball, too? This has been It Always Will Be. Thanks for making it your first listen every single day. Locked on. I'll say it again. Thanks for making it your first listen every single day. Dose Grande.